on. Hey, Gabe, what do we talk about on today's episode? How adversity is a gift from the universe, how you need to invest in relationships if you want to grow your team, uh, about all the personal self-care things that help you level up as an entrepreneur, and about how amazing bald dudes like us are. Yes, I love it. I love it. I'm going to give you my cliff notes. How selling chocolate to blind people led to a deep relationship a decade later. The more space you give yourself and your team, the better you will all do. You will never succeed if you sacrifice your own time and space. How you learned 20 years of business trauma in three months that led to today's successes. And I'm talking lost all your money, your friends, your family, death threats, and 40 employees. How self-awareness is key. Ignorance anywhere in your business will lead to pain. Skills don't develop themselves. You have to develop them. Entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. Relationships are the secret weapon to building a team and culture. Positive confrontation is a guiding principle to success. How helping an employee's daughter read catapulted the success of your business. The golden advice on outsourcing and hiring a team. How a push-button mentality will always lead to failure. How doing less will always create more. And how adversity is the greatest gift the universe can give you. I think that got most of it. That's awesome. That's a lot for an hour. So I'm just going to shut up now and we're going to cue the intro. So let's get into the episode. Welcome back to another episode of the Mind of George Show, where I forget what my intro is every single time, but it's easy when I have a guest. I have a bald brother in arms, a heart-centered, conscious human being who gives me hope in the world of marketing, especially when he runs it for you, runs a team of 64, interested in cold therapy, just hung out with me in Montana, dropped tons of knowledge bombs, amazing father, amazing partner, amazing friend. So let me welcome to the show my good friend, Gabe. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. That's hands down the best intro I've ever gotten. So thank you. Yeah. And what I love about relationships is like we haven't even known each other that long, but the moment we connected, I was like, I got you, bro. Like we we're good. Yeah, that's how I felt when he came on my show. I was like, holy shit, I need to know this guy. Yeah. I was like, I was like, I was like, God, I feel like I lost my long lost twin. And I was like, we both, you know, have shiny bald heads and we take ice baths and there's only a few of us that are crazy enough to do that. And my wife still is like, why do you shave your head when you have a full head of hair? I'm like, because it's so much easier. And she's like, aren't you going to miss it one day? I'm like, I'd laser it off right now if I had the patience. Like, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm okay being committed. Yeah. I don't have that uh, problem having tons of hair, but I started years ago. Like, it was annoyed that it, if it got, like, this long, I was annoyed, so I was buzzing it, and then I was like, I might as well go all the way, because there's not much left right in this area. So. No, no. <laughs> See, like, I, 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 hair bothers me, like the feeling of hair, and I, when I would have hair, when it's dry, I don't like the feeling. I would need, like, product in it, or it's wet, and I was like, this seems like a waste of my time. It's not helping me be happier. It's not making me any money. It's not making a difference in the world. And then, you know, once you get deployed once and you can't shower for three weeks, you're like, yeah, hair doesn't really do well. And so you get a taste of freedom and you're good. So I'm going to kick the show off differently because you've listened to the show, but you were also at the event. So what I would love to ask you is how was Montana? What was your biggest takeaway? Like what's some of the wisdom that you can share that came from you being and partying with us in Montana that you dropped in the room and added a ton of value with as well? (laughs) Well, thank you. Yeah, it was it was incredible. One, Montana is absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. And like, if you haven't been there or don't live there, then I feel sorry for you. <laughs> um, but it was it was incredible showing up because I know for me, like, I always super reconnect to myself and my creativity in the universe in nature. Mm. I've known that since I was really young is just something inherent in me. Um, so getting off the plane in Montana is or or driving there like I did last year um, is always just an amazing experience to just walk into that, that world and that space. Um, and I knew, I knew coming in there that, um, one, you, you and I had just a fantastic, you know, episode on, on my show. And I was like, man, I'm, I'm going to, I don't know what's it's going to be like, I have no idea what's going to happen, but I know it's going to be good. Um, and I, and I also 
try to, I don't do this perfectly, but I try to enter any new room or new space and say, you know what, I'm going to show up as myself. I'm going to give my all and then I'll, I'll leave it all on the table. And then whatever happens is outside of my control then. And so I was walking, I was walking in, I got in late, late the night before I was walking up to registration and Tyler came up to me and he's like, Hey Gabe, great to see you. I'm like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> uh, and, but I felt like he was kind of familiar. So we had connected in another Facebook group, but then while we were standing there, he's like, do you remember 10 years ago in Chardon, Ohio at the library when you were giving a Facebook ads course? And I'm like, yeah, he's like, I was there. I was, I was the kid there trying to sell chocolate to, uh, blind people <laughs> yep yeah <laughs> and i was like oh my god dude and i so i was i and then, so it was crazy like the moment i got there like the universe brought me back to somebody that i hadn't seen in a long time and it was i was telling him later at the vip dinner um how that night was the first time i sold a ten thousand dollar high ticket offer and i really really needed the money uh so it was so it was a. Uh, it was i remember that and i after he explained it, I didn't remember him being there. But from the moment of, you know, walking into registration and just getting such a warm welcome from him um, and from Jay um, and then, you know, walk in the room, you know, and you come up and give me a big hug. It was just it was just really, really open um, and it was a really safe space. And I don't. I don't have like mechanical pieces or structures to tell people of how to do this, but I do know that there are a handful of places in my life where I walk in that I know I'm safe and I can be myself. Mm. And it's, it's definitely an intentional container that I know you created and I understand it even more after the event. Um, but that's what was really special about it because from, from the first moment there, I was like, man, these are all my people, which yeah. is, that's hard to pull off in a big room. Um, and then on top of that, it was, I just, I just knew I could be open and honest and, and you really led the way that there, I mean, you really set the tone of being transparent and, and authentic, which like I said, I knew you would. Um, but for, for me, the biggest takeaways for me were one is the more space I create for and give to my team, the better they're going to do instead of me, which I'm not a terrible taskmaster. I don't think anybody would tell you that on my team, but I do like to push hard sometimes. And there's, there's seasons for that, but I'm realizing that the more space I give my team, the better they're going to do. And then also for the first quarter of this year, like I had been working like crazy and not protecting my own time and space and my own containers. And so those were the two big takeaways. So I decided to wear my VIP bracelet until, um, until I'm confident and, and pleased with how I've implemented everything that I learned there. And those are, those are the main two things is to get much better at creating and protecting containers for myself and essentially for my team too, of just creating space. Cause the games that we played too were incredible. Like, and I, it's so funny um, to me how, how like the universe works. And um, I, I set an intention like six weeks ago that I want to become better at playing and better at like having fun and like better, you know, playing with my son and just being more expanding that part of my life. And so I generally fucking hate games um, <laughs> when I don't see the purpose of it. But I was like, you know what, I'm going to do this and I'm going to set aside all my garbage and all the, all the mind trash with this. And I did it. And then I, I'm so glad I did because it, the event taught me to be a better father. Um, which means more than anything else I learned there, to be honest. Um, and then on top of that, it just, uh, I, w I was able to borrow some of your courage in multiple areas. And so I appreciate you, man. It was, I, I wish I could do an event with you every month. <laughs> I, I, that, well, that would be the ultimate goal when I, I like take over Montana and like, I just have a compound. Like, I'm like, Hey, we'll just do this. Like all the time. And actually, you know, you just said something that reminded me uh, of what Brian said in the room, and you said that, and it's such an interesting concept, of, like borrowing courage. Like, I absolutely love that. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, I was just sharing. I did a, I did a podcast uh, when they listened to this, maybe a couple weeks ago, and like one of the biggest takeaways. But uh, one of them, like I talked about space, but how success can never be solo. It's never a solo game. And really, yeah. I think that's one of the big needle movers I didn't even realize that I utilized by having a team a lot was that 
what my team allows me to do is to borrow some of their courage when I don't have any or them vice versa, right? And what I loved about everything and your energy in the room and what we all did is that we all did it. It was co-creation. It wasn't, you know, my creation. It was ours. And um, yeah, my four-year-old's responsible for me playing games in entrepreneur rooms because I'm the same way as you. I'm like, play? Who's got time to play? I got work to do. I got this to do. And it was yeah. like, it's really, it's really interesting to put it in. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask my normal question now. Cause I, I think I already have 8 million places to go with this because of your experience and your wisdom, but you have a lot of experience in this game. And you were in a library <laughs> 10 years ago with my CEO when he was selling <laughs> turtle to blind people to raise money for a nonprofit. And you were teaching a Facebook ads course in Ohio in a library back in 2011. Like you've got some, you got some licks in this game. And I, I, I know I know some of it, but like as you look back and, and choose the window, whether it's a small one or a big one, when you look back on all of it, like what would you say was one of the biggest – I use the word mistake, but like what was one of the biggest mistakes that you learned a lesson from? And like what's the lesson that you carry forward with you now? Yeah, I've been doing uh, a lot of introspective thinking since I got back and uh, around this and I – you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time in reflection because it helps me move forward. And I think, I think probably the most valuable experience I have is when I, when I turned 18, I, the day I turned 18 moved out of my parents' house because that was not a good situation. Um, and I had already been doing like remodeling and contracting and side work and making more money than most, you know, kids my age for sure, making tons of money. Um, so I was good at sales and I was, I was fairly good at execution when it was just me. Um, and so I moved out when I was 18 and immediately started building my own construction company. Um, and by like five years later, I was doing a couple million dollars a year, um, which I sustained that for like almost four years, but then I was growing so quickly without wisdom i you know and without a ton of experience that when we came into 2007 some i worked for really really rich of the rich affluent um clients but they were also overspending um and so a handful of my clients like three of my clients had their credit lines frozen and financial issues that were like early waves of the of the um housing market crash yeah and the recession and so their, their credit lines got frozen or they had issues or problems, which trickled down to me getting stuck for a quarter million dollars in a matter of like six weeks. Um, and part of that was also poor execution. Like I was failing, I wasn't running the projects like I should have, but it was mainly, it was a combination of both, but it was mainly money drying up. Um, and I was cash flowing everything with no financial control. So I got stuck for a quarter million dollars. Um, it's business started going out of control, I, you know, and I was losing money. I had about 40 W2 employees and I had about another 30 um, vendor, you know, subcontractors. Um, I had married, I had gotten married when I was 19 to, you know, a girl I met in high school um, and she was bipolar um, and had massive family issues on top of that. And so my marriage was a disaster. Um, and then as soon as the money started running out and I stopped handing her literally hundreds and hundreds of dollars every week to do whatever she wanted with, she hated me all of a sudden. I'm sure she hated me the whole time. Um, but, <laughs> but that started to implode. And then my childhood best friend who I'd grown up from since I, we were literally like one or two years old, um, he was born with a condition called spina bifida where your spine's open and they have to sew it open when you're, you know, when you're born. And so, that's a degenerative disease. And so his organs started shutting down. And so it was like March, April, um, that I got stuck for all the money. It was, I ended up renegotiating about $650,000 in credit lines and debt that I had built up for the business. Um, cause I thought I was going to be able to save it. And then my marriage went from bad to horrifically terrible nightmarish. And then my best friend died, um, July 7th, I think. And so that, 90 day window of hell, um, led me to go, you know what, I'm out. I, I, I just don't have the, I don't have the stamina anymore. I don't have anybody around me. Um, I was also a youth pastor during that period. And when I went to 
talked to my pastor and said, like, hey, I need a break from being a youth pastor because I've got all this personal stuff going on. He's like, well, you know, the, the the youth group's really growing. How about you just figure out a way to keep keep being a youth pastor? Um, and so, which I said, I said, no, I'm done. I, that's why I came here to tell you I'm, I'm done. Um, but in a matter of like 90 days, I lost all my money, all my friends, all my community, my church, my family also was uber religious and didn't understand of it. And so they, they basically stopped talking to me except for one or two people in my family. I have a large family. And so I, I shut the business down because I was, I narrowly avoided fraud charges, federal fraud charges for the amount of money that I had out on credit, which I had clients that were going to pay for it, but then they didn't. Um, and, and I had people not banging on my door, threatening to kill me. And so I moved, I moved away, like just, I moved like half an hour away. So that people didn't know where I was. And as I was sitting there licking my wounds and trying to figure out what to do next, um, I realized like, man, I, I didn't get good advice. I didn't listen to the people that were giving me good advice. Um, I made all these mistakes, but what did I enjoy out of it and what, it, what I want to do? Um, and I had like 3000 bucks cash in my name. Um, and I, and I went, ended up going bankrupt for a million dollars and 13 cents, which was kind of funny to me in the moment. Um, and I was sitting there and I was like, okay, what do I do next? And I realized that one, I loved marketing. I loved sales. And I was really, really good at that because there was, I sold everything. I did all the marketing. I did, I did everything that what I realized I was not strong in is I didn't understand financial control or management. I was financially ignorant. Um, which is, you know, which was weird to say after running a multi-million dollar company, but it was the truth. And then I also realized that I, I was not a good manager and I wasn't a good leader because also like in that previous year, I had uncovered that like multiple, multiple employees were like stealing from me left and right. Mm. Um, which comes down to if it's happening across the board, it's a leadership problem. It, it does happen period. Like it doesn't matter how good of a leader you are, you'll have people steal from you, but um, I just realized I wasn't a, I wasn't an effective leader. I wasn't an effective manager. I didn't have financial control. I really didn't, I had not mastered business. However, in going through just like that chaotic period of pain and chaos and like something I wouldn't wish on my worst enemies, um, I learned a ton. I was like, you know what? I'm going to rebuild, I'm going to get back on my feet and I'm going to incrementally do this in a way that it's so solid that you can't knock it over. And I told myself in that moment, I said, I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 40 again. Um, and so year over year, I've, you know, chosen it like an intention for the year of things to focus on and, and relearn like years ago. Now I said, I'm going to become an excellent manager because that's something I need to learn. Uh, and, you know, a year after that, I said, I'm, I'm going to become financially intelligent. Um, and I just kind of like piece by piece, you know, built my built my way back to where I'm in an amazing relationship, have a great son, have an incredible team and, uh, you know, have a profitable and successful business. But it wasn't wasn't without my million dollar education. So I think I maybe went off track from the question, but that's my answer. <laughs> so that answered the question better than you could ever answer the question. Like I made a note. I was like, uh, 20 years of business trauma in 90 minutes or 90 days. It's, it's, it's exactly. true, but you know, it's actually yeah. a really good segue because you said something that I think is so imperative is that uh, like what I hear underneath all of that is this kind of level of self-awareness, right? Where you're like, God, like yeah. I was ignorant to this. Like I wasn't good here. I wasn't good here. Okay, cool. And then once you became aware of it, you're like, well, the path seems really crystal clear. If those were the things that were broken, let's go. But yeah. I, I do want to transition to current state because how many employees do you have on your team now? 65. So, and we're 100% remote. So, yeah. And so, you now manage (laughs) a couple years later, but very successfully, a team of 65 people all remote. And so, I'd say you develop the skill. And so, now, like, as you look for that, like, what are some of those things that you've implemented, like, tool wise as a leader or even intention wise to, like, keep that going? I mean, like, I have a team of six remote, and I feel like I'm pulling what little hair I have out left and not because of them, because of me, because like, it's not a skill, 
that I've developed because I'm like, leave me alone. Don't message me. Okay, now everybody message me right now. And, you know, (laughs) but I would love to hear like kind of like how you kind of navigate that, how you run through that and like what skills you developed to utilize that to be able to have a team of 65 remote and have a massively successful business. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And the, uh, I mean, I, everything I've, I've, you know, had to put the time in and learn. And so the first thing I always tell people is like, I learned after the first business and after a second kind of failed side business, as I was starting this one that, you know, entrepreneurship is a marathon and it's, it's not a sprint. So slow down for a minute and figure out what you need to master it at this, in this season and managing a team. I've in my first business, it definitely was a headache to me. And I think that was just mainly because I'd heard people talk about it that way. I'd seen ineffective leaders and they didn't understand relationships. When I started building this business, I, I, I don't know if I was conscious of the intention um, because I was still, it took me years to process the pain that I went through. Um, It was, it was not (laughs) like, I feel like only in the last three years I've forgiven myself. And I think I'm like 90, 95% healthy whole, which is pretty good. Um, But so in the beginning, I don't know if I was aware of it because there was so much pain going on and a second marriage to a bipolar person that failed. And then I, third relationship, I got it straight and I'm very happy. Um, but <laughs> one thing I've learned, I'll point this out and I'll get to you, to the main question is if you're not with the right person, good luck building a business. So, uh, so that's a whole other topic to unpack, but yes. Yeah. Um, but as far as building a team relationship is the only leverage and motivation you have period end of story. That's all. So if you understand that, then you'll invest in the relationship first with your team members, and then you'll worry about everything else second. Um, so as an example, the gal, um, one of my team members, Danielle, she joined our team almost five years ago now. And and my team jokes about this now, but we didn't have all our hiring funnels and elimination hiring funnels and processes in place back then. But like we joke now and people say like, I'm glad I was, I'm in now because I never would have made it. Um, if we had all these things in place, (laughs) but she came in to be my personal assistant and I had no filters and I just, except for, I was like, man, she seems like a great gal to work with. Um, and within a matter of like 60 days, I was like, or less, I was like, oh my God, she, she can't write. Um, you know, she, she's technically challenged. Like there was all these problems. Um, and, but I was like, you know what? if I commit to the relationship first and the heart and the attitude is right, then I think I can solve everything else. And so I just, one of my guiding principles is positive confrontation, which I've lived my whole life, honestly, but and maybe not always positive, but now it's positive confrontation. (laughs) And so I was like, you know, you, you know, your writing is just not up to standards. It's it's no good. And so you're going to need to solve that. Um, And I want to, let's move you into this different role because you can't write on my behalf because that would be a disaster. Um, or send emails or do things on my behalf. And she's like, absolutely, whatever you need to do. Um, you know, let's do it. She said, I'm happy to move into any position. And in that moment, and over and over and over, I've seen with Danielle that her, she is so hardworking, so caring, and willing to do whatever it takes to to make the team successful. She always puts the team ahead of herself. In that moment, I was like, okay, cool. That's a good sign. And from that moment forward, her and I have built growth plans and said, okay, over the next six months, 90 days, six months, or even year long growth plans, we would chunk down into smaller objectives. Here's what I want you to work on and improve on. And here's, you know, why we're doing this. And, and we built these plans and we, we worked on improving her skill set because her heart and her attitude was right. Today, like I said, almost five years later, um, she is the senior leader on my team and is incredibly effective and makes us super profitable and clients love her. She's really well written, really well spoken. She's excellent, excellent operationally. And I know that that only would have happened that never would have happened if I didn't say, you know what, I'm going to invest in her as a person first. And then the other things will follow after that. And the other thing um, that, that I realized in my relationship with her, which is why I just really value who she is in my life and on, on my team is early on, um, 
like a six months or a year into her working with me, like I could just tell she was distracted, like even over chat or messenger as we were talking um, and on calls and stuff. Uh, and I just, you know, just did a check in with her and said, Hey, like what's going on? Like, is everything okay? And she's like, she's like, you know, my daughter's really struggling with, with reading. And like, they said, they're going to hold her back. And she's, and my daughter's really upset about this. And I said, Hey, you know what? I said, like after work today or tomorrow, I'm like, why don't we get on a zoom call with her? Um, and I'll just show her how I learned to read because I didn't read till beginning of third grade. And I, I was horribly unacademic. And I, I said, I'm not a teacher. I can't promise anything, but I said, I'll show, I can show you guys what I learned and, and how, how it helped me. So I just showed her how, I learned to read, how I speed read now, like just how I've learned to do it. I reverse engineered all that because the way that I was being taught didn't work for me. And so I showed that to her and a week later, she or like a week later and then two weeks later, she was giving me updates and she's like, my daughter has sped up her reading. They're not going to hold her back. And I am so, so grateful that you helped her. And I was like, of course I would help her. <laughs> like she's your kid. And like our kids are way more important than all this other stuff we do. Um, and so I realized with all my heart, I wanted to help Danielle and her daughter. And so I just did. And I, but I started to learn from those actions, what my real intention was, which was to invest in the relationship. And when you do that, if the heart is there and the attitude there and the, and the core of the person is in the right place, you can teach skill. And so if you want to manage a large team, you have to just invest in the relationships first because that's the only leverage you have. And when my team comes to me and says, hey, I'm struggling with this person or I'm, um, you know, this clients were in a rough spot or like there's this vendor relationship that isn't quite right. I always say, like, just jump on the phone and invest in the relationship. And I always say that's the only leverage you have. People are only going to follow you or do what you ask or show up their best if you invest in them. And so that's that's my big secret, I guess, not that big of a secret of how to run a big team is like, just take really good care of people and the rest of it will work out. Okay. <laughs> well, there's, there's so much wisdom and gold in what you unpacked and it challenges a common belief that I hear people say in entrepreneurship all the time. That's either really wholeheartedly agreed upon or really rejected, which is, you know, hire person for personality and then train skill. And I was like, but what most people miss is what you said. You literally will list it out. Attitude, heart, intention, like, you know, things like that. Like there's people that have good personalities Like you can be stand up comedians, but it doesn't mean they're aligned with my right. mission, my vision and boom. And I think what you said is such a big distinction when you get into that because skills can be trained. But I, I see people all the time like, oh, I hired my friend. I'm like, Oh, uh, well, your, your drinking buddy for wine Wednesdays is a little bit different, you know, personality wise than you need in the office. And so, you know, right. he hearing that, I just think it's a really important thing to acknowledge when you are hiring for personality, quote unquote, you're not really hiring personality. You're like, is their heart in the right place? Is their attitude yeah. here? Are they open? Do they have the same morals and the same values? And if those answers are yes, then you pick the team player that's on the team and you're like, cool, like we can train you how to write. Like we can train you how to do this. Cause like, I mean, here, by the way, just anybody haven't really, like none of us were born with the skills we have, like just throwing that out. There, right? Like I'd like to think like, I, I'd like to think I came out of the womb, like one of the best marketers in the world, but like, I, I highly doubt it. I had to learn multi-million dollar loss lessons to get here. Right. So, yeah. so I have a question about that. And I want to acknowledge you before I answer this question, because I, I, I know why we're friends and why we drive so well, but you said it about my event, but what I'm hearing the thread underneath it is that when you continually say, like, I invest in the relationship, what you're doing is creating a culture of safety where the hammer doesn't drop, right? Like where somebody's life or job isn't on the line because of a bad day or an emotion or feeling, there's a safe container that allows it. Now, of course, there's things that you can mitigate, like you can't lie for me, you can't steal, right? Like things like that, but... You know, right. I think one of the challenges that I see a lot of times, like when I go into companies, like I go to a hundred million dollar company and they're like, I have to work 20 hours a day. I'm going to get fired. I'm like, well, you guys are all going to lose. I was like, yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta take that off the table. And like, I've had to go in a company has been like, there's a 90 day moratorium that regardless of performance, work hours or what they do, you can't touch them. And they're like, no, I'm like, great. I'm leaving. And they're like, well, yeah. and then the, you know, the company 10 X's, right. And so I want to acknowledge you for creating like the container that you do and, and honoring safety and culture, you know, over everything. 
And the question I'm about to ask, I don't think it's something you struggle with, but I know a lot of people do. Um, how do you or how do you recommend people manage the expectations of employees, right? Because I watch people hire people and they're like, they didn't do it as good as me, fire. Or it's not how it was supposed to be, boom. And you said something when we started of like, you have to give them space. And it yeah. took me 50, no, it took me 12 years of leading Marines and nine years of leading entrepreneurs to be willing to let them get their own black eyes and not really give a shit. Like being able to like, oh, that's ugly. Cool. Let's just not do it again. Right. <laughs> but yeah. it's, it's a skill set. So how do you recommend people navigate that? Because you manage a big team and I think it's your heart and culture that you put into it. But I also see people like, well, they didn't do it like I said, or they missed a step in the process. And it's like, well, you can't guillotine them. Or it's never going to learn. And so can you tie that together for me? Because I think it's such a profound concept. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and the one thing I'll say about attitude is that you can only truly see somebody's attitude based on their actions. So when you're, you're talking about like qualifications, it, personality, yeah, that's great. But like attitude is demonstrated through action. And that's the other thing I wanted to augment there. Um, when it comes to creating that safe space. I, I had a friend of mine um, who I just met recently and young guy starting out in our world, building an agency and doing marketing. And he reached out and said, Hey, like, do you have any advice on hiring salespeople? And I said, yeah, I said, um, but first tell me what your, what your annual revenue is and what your profit is after you've paid yourself. Um, and he's like, yikes. And he wrote me back and it, you know, and it, and, and he's starting out and we all start out there. So, so, and, and I won't name him and he's, he's a good guy and he's head on the right track, but I, I think he was doing like, he said, I think we did 170,000 last year. And he's like, there's nothing left after we pay ourselves. So I wrote back and, and he knows, and like, I give him free advice here and there. And I'm like, you know, I'm super direct, man. And I love you and I care about you. And I said, and I, and I opened my email that way. And I said, and I said, so here's my thoughts. So what you want, what you're telling me is that you want to hire somebody to do a job that you haven't figured out how to do well. And, and do we have that straight? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I said, so what you need to, you need to read fanatical prospecting. And then um, I gave him another book. It'll, it'll come to me later, but I'll end read profit first um, by Mike McCollitz. And it's a good one. Yeah. That's like, if you're an entrepreneur and you haven't read that book, then you need to stop what you're doing and go read it after this podcast. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, both of those probably. But, but so I think that when there's that attitude from leadership, it's because they believe that they can just push a button, bring in human, human do job really well. Like, I think that's like the mentality or the mindset. And if you've done any of this work or even attempted it poorly, even if it's not your role, then you'll start to learn, oh, shit, like the first time you turn on Facebook ads, you don't become a millionaire. Yeah. Or the first time you write an email, you know, you might, you know, leave the placeholder in there and look like an idiot because we've all done that. <laughs> like it says, hi, friend or hi, name. Yep. <laughs> or like we all do those things. And so if you if if you're immature as a leader, you have a push button mentality. But if you're mature as a leader, then you realize that repetition over repetition and persistence and time is what creates excellence. And even the greatest athletes, you know, the greatest in entrepreneurship and in you know business and life and sports, um, they have really bad days and do really stupid things. Um, but that doesn't mean that you don't want to put them on the field yeah. because over time they'll just become incredibly strong and persistent. And I remember playing soccer as a kid and there was this one coach that just screamed and yelled at me. And I ended up quitting soccer that year. And because I was like, there's no, if that's what the next level is like, which it doesn't have to be that way. I was like nine or 10 or something. I was pretty young, but I was like, if that's what the next level is like, I have zero interest in being screamed at the whole time. Um, and so you've got to, create that safety for your team. And the only way that you can create safety for your team, and I'm going back to what I said a second ago here, is if you are good at your job and if you've put in the time and you're willing to try and fail. And so I'm really grateful to be in a position now where I can pay my team to fail. Mm -hmm. And it's a really cool place to be. And the only reason I can pay my team to fail is because I got good at sales. And then I learned financial management, which means I have a cushion in projects and in my bank account for, you know, massive failures. 
Um, and it's just, I just think it's short sighted and ignorant, to be honest, if you think that, you know, you're going to master something day one or master the thing that you were good at in a different environment in this environment in day one. It's like, you know, I'm not a runner, but running in Ohio is different than running at the top of a mountain in, in Montana. Yep. It's different. Yep. And like you could be phenomenal here. And then if you jump off a plane, you know, in Montana or like Denver, like a high altitude place, good luck. If you think you're just a day one, go crush it again. Cause new environments have new challenges and we have to adapt. And a new business is like that. A new project is like that. Clients are all different and all have their own challenges. And so my mentality is like when I fail and when my team fails, I always say, okay, how can we face our work? How can we jump in and face the work and do the hard thing and have the hard conversation or own up to the mistake? And I've made some massive, massive mistakes over the years and my team has too. Um, and I also, I guess the last thing I'll say on this for the, for a minute here is when my team just fucking destroys something and drops the ball, and it's a big one. I, I, then they, they let me know because they know it's safe. I go to the client and I say, you know what, George, I'm so sorry that we dropped the ball on your project. It's my fault. Yep. And that's how you protect your team. Cause guess whose fault it is? It is my fault. Yeah. <laughs> it's my team. I didn't, I didn't put them in a position of success or like, and even if it was their fault, maybe it's still my fault and I'm still going to own it because that's what, that's what a leader does. You know, and dude, so if you, Oh, I like, <laughs> dude, I have like, we'd have to do a 10 hour show, right? Cause like we're getting into like deep work at this point. But I, what you just said came up on my men's call last night where I was talking about shadow work and the ego of leadership and responsibility. And there's this deep concept that I was taught in personal development, like in 2012 and it, you know, Jocko talks about it, but it's a hundred percent responsible a hundred percent of the time. And it took me and my fragile ego probably five years to understand that it, like, it wasn't that I was responsible for the car accident. Like I wasn't driving the car for the car accident that I witnessed, but responsibility is a place of empowerment, not a vis- yeah. victim, right? And so I love like your term that you said earlier, what was it called? Like positive confrontation. Like, can we yeah. face the work, you know, that we did? And I absolutely love it because what you said is so imperative. Like I, I watch people hang their teams out to dry. They'll blame their clients. They'll gaslight them. They'll do it all. But what yeah. it took me a lot of failures to realize is that the path to success is in how I mitigate that resistance. And if I just like, oh, yeah, I did it. Like I'll give you an example. Like we talk about relationships, right? Like if you're not with the right person, good luck building a business. It's like if your wife comes up to you and says like, hey, it hurt my feelings when you did this. You're like, I didn't do that. No, I didn't do that. No, no, you did it. You did it. I'm going to gaslight you like, good luck, right? And like you prolong and retrain this behavior of like pain and anger and sadness. But it's like, I'll never forget the moment. Like I came home, my Lindsay listens to this. I'm going to get kicked in the shins. (laughs) I I came home. I came home from a men's event with John Wineland. And I walked in the door and he's like, when you get home, there's a good chance that your ladies are going to be upset at you, right? You've been gone for a week. You're doing men's work. You've been doing deep work. It's going to come up because you're going to get tested when you get home. And he's (laughs) like, I'm going to give you a tool. He's like, make eye contact, match her breathing, and you're only allowed to say one thing. And I was like, what's the one thing? He's like, that makes sense. And I'll never forget this, man. Like, I walked in the door, and she's like, and you didn't do this? uh," And, like, all verifiably right. And I was like, that that makes sense. And it bought me, like, this one moment of not being reactive (laughs) to stand in it. And then she literally went from, like, a 10 to a 4. And she's like, oh, yeah, babe, and I really missed you. And I'm like, I missed you too, right? But, like, the same thing happens in work. Like, with clients, with teams, with employees. It's like the moment you're willing to face it, it mitigates the actual trauma of it all. And then a new, a new step, by the way, like to take it deeper, especially with clients. I do this with my high-end consulting clients because newsflash, when you sell information, you have no guarantee of the result. Um, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, well, this didn't work because you did this. And I'm like, I, I'm like, I'm not going to debate them. And I'm like, that makes sense. And then that's level one. Level two, I've never talked about this publicly. Level two 
is then you give an example in their world to completely validate the belief. And you're like, oh, is it like that time when I said that? And that, and they're like, yeah. And it's, Man, I like that, dude. <laughs> it, dude, I'm telling you, like, I waited till we're 38 minutes into this episode. I've never talked about this publicly, like, ever. But if you want one of the best coaching tools, relationship tools, anything, it's a never invalidate. So always validate, like, oh, that makes sense, which will kind of energy redirect but then if you really want to take it and you want to take it deep like my wife for example she's like god when you said that like it made me feel like this i'm like well that makes sense was it like the time in the car the other day when i said this and the moment i can give an example that i do it's an immediate safety net like and i mean an immediate safety net um so just a tool that's awesome, dude. Thank you. I'm not, that's, it's stacked like that. I've never heard that. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's something, and you talked about it earlier, right? But I was going to ask this question um, because like what you're talking about with building a team and building culture and the level of which you lead your team, we alluded to this at the beginning where we talk about space and, you know, I'm a big proponent of space. Yeah. The level of work that you've had to do on yourself and had to explore on yourself to be able to even see it like this is a skill in itself. And, and I would love to hear your thoughts around that because in our world, and we and I roll in the similar world, everyone thinks there's another strategy or tactic to get the answer. There's a book to read to lead the team. There's a somehow magic formula, boom, right? And you know, you said it earlier, it's like when you come into this game and you did a post about this the other day, you can't do good work till you've done a lot of bad work, right? Something along those lines, I'm paraphrasing. And yep. it's like, yeah, I can get 85% open rates on emails to this day. And I'm like, and I've probably fudged millions of emails, <laughs> millions of them. And I've got zero sales on million dollar launches. And I put a broken link in a Facebook ad that cost 50 grand before we caught it. Like, <laughs> I, I totally, it's only funny I've done it. <laughs> so. <laughs> I totally get it. And I went on a tangent there for a minute, but like, I would love to hear like your thoughts or your processor around that because you and I share a lot of similarities like I feel really validated when I talk to you about this stuff right like cold therapy breath work stillness mindset but what I want everybody listening I'm kind of agendized in this question and I'm leading the shit out of it is there's a direct correlation between the work you've done on yourself which isn't been in in my team or in meetings or in reading books and the success of your team and your business yeah it's definitely, uh, I was telling one of my coaching clients yesterday, I said, I said, when I was, uh, you know, when I was running a quarter million dollar year agency, I wasn't a, a CEO, CEO that could deserve a million dollar agency. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure where this came from. It'll probably come up for me. And if it does, I'll share. Um, but I've always, when I've gone through something bad or that I didn't like the outcome of, or like it just didn't go the way I wanted, I've always very quickly afterward, if not in the midst of like receiving the impact from the mistake or the blow or what happened, I've always gone, man, what could I have done differently? Or what did I do to cause this? And I think it started out of probably not not a super productive place and more of a negative place of like what did i do to cause this from a guilty sense but over over time and just continuing that path um it's not a guilt driven thing it's not a negative thing but i just i'm definitely highly self-aware and i have I, that's one thing i think i was born with um and because i'm i'm on the spectrum i have i don't even know if it's classified this way anymore but i have asperger's and so I didn't know that until I was 30, um, which is probably good. But I used to just like implode relationships or say exactly what was on my mind or just do things that were other people did not understand. So I would go and uh, I then I would sit back and go, OK, so what did I do? Like, why? Why did that not work? I thought it was going to work. So I, I evaluate my own behavior. and I evaluate human behavior a lot. And if you truly take time to reflect on your own behavior and evaluate what happened and what you did and the results were, then if you want to take the shortcut and not grow, you can go, oh, well, it was George's fault. You know, it didn't work because he did something. 
and and then you're off the hook and you can just keep operating the way you were or then those answers never worked for me and i was like man that just doesn't seem right like it would just it would just eat me and eat me and it would roll around inside until i would go you know what well what i'm going to do differently next time is this because i do have input and i do have control of my own behavior and attitude and i i have control of my decisions and any time that i'm consistent in my inputs and the decisions i make then things work out better um it's not that i'm not going to hit these huge roadblocks or problems but i can at a somewhat objective level we're not completely objective ourselves but at a somewhat objective level i can go oh well that didn't work and i wasn't prepared so how can i prepare differently or this person failed and this may happen again so how can i put in a safeguard for that so that person doesn't fail i remember um in like 08 or 09 i was in the middle of building the business we have today i was also partnering with somebody else um, which is a great lesson in partnerships again because it didn't work out well at all but um i was doing this huge point of sale migration for a company in Chicago that had like 15 locations and they were doing like three to 4 million a month. Like they're a pretty good sized company and their old it guy who was getting pushed out without his knowledge, I thought um, was working side by side with me on this, on this project. And he's like, yeah, I backed up all the data. I backed everything up before we do this big migration. So I'm like, all right, cool. I totally trusted him without verifying, which is a horrible thing to do in business and life, um, especially business. And so I just deleted all the systems to reinstall the new point of sale software. And I deleted like $50,000 worth of data, um, which the 50,000 would have been one thing, you know, which is not a good thing, but it would have had like a three to $5 million impact. And so the old IT guy, claimed to back things up, but they didn't, it didn't work. It actually wasn't his fault. I don't think maybe he was trying to sabotage me. I don't know. That's not, that's not my thing or my responsibility, but so he didn't have things backed up. And then my partner at the time was like, there's nothing we can do. And I, I said, no, I said, there's always something to do. And so I figured out over the course of three or four hours, how to find enough of the backups. And then I figured out where the source files were. And I spent the next 12 hours hand rebuilding data and all this stuff and i got it back to a position where i didn't get killed by this uh you know mobster because the guy that owned the company really was second generation mobster and i ended up working like 44 hours straight and i got it all solved and i just i in that moment like all the things my grandfather taught me who raised me i was like you know what i can do the work and i'm willing to this is going to be painful and hard and it's going to suck but i'm going to take responsibility for this because i don't have another option and i'm unwilling to let this mistake cause hundreds of employees to suffer because there's hundreds of employees in the company i'm unwilling to let this crush this business i'm building um and so yeah i mean i think that that level of awareness is a piece of it and then just taking full ownership of your life not partial full yes. is is really a, really a key part <laughs> yeah i um so. i want to i want to clarify too so uh a book recommendation for everybody just to even understand this concept jocko did an amazing job of breaking it down in extreme ownership from like a, a tactitional perspective and so i highly recommend it you want to go deeper into the pd world shoot me a dm i will break it down in a level that i still fathom struggle comprehending sometimes but it makes sense now that i'm in it but what i what i love gabe <clears throat> is like we're really what i've i've figured out is that all of us like in my opinion entrepreneurs are all destined to be successful that's why we're an entrepreneur we know we have the drive and really yeah. the only thing that gets in our way is stagnation and not being aware or over analyzing or collecting our mistakes as evidence is the easiest way to cement our feet in place and so yeah. what I think is so powerful is it took me years to realize that if I can look at a situation and be like, oh, I did that. I'm not going to do that again. What did I learn? And actually just move forward. I'm on the path to success. And for years, I thought it was a skill set of like, well, I feel guilty about it. I'm dragging 87 anchors of things I did 22 years ago of as I was a different human forward and expecting a different result. And so um, – one thing I want to say about what I shared earlier about uh, when I was when I was laughing with Gabe about like that makes sense and where I shows up. The reason that's so effective for me 
is because as I do my own growth and my own healing and my codependent ties, when people come to me and they say things, I still get triggered personally, therefore invalidating them. And so that gives me an ability to kind of pause my own wedge for a minute. And by the time I'm done, I'm like, oh, I can totally see this. But one note is it only works if your heart's in the right place and you're really clear and, and you're there. Uh, but it's a tool that that kind of works. And so I have a question for you around like your practices. Like you and I have a lot of like similar practices. And so, yeah. um, you know, I wrote this note earlier how doing less will always create more when we were talking. And I feel yeah. like you really embody this at like a deep level. And so I personally feel like and after hanging out with you in person, like I feel the same way, like you are so present that I feel like a byproduct of your presence is a safe container and a deep invested relationship. And I would love to hear like what kind of your day looks like. Like, do you meditate? Do you do breath work? Do you do cold therapy? Like what, what is it that you do and how do you prioritize those practices to sharpen the skill of your presence so that you can lead a team of 65 and be a good father and have a good relationship. I'd kind of love to hear what you do. Yeah. So my, you posted in the, in your group earlier, like what's the biggest roadblock um, or the big thing that, you know, that would change everything for you. And I wrote in there in the comments that if I could like wave a magic wand, essentially, I would like to have more structure and more discipline because mm. I don't feel like I'm super structured and super disciplined. However, I, I do have a methodology that works for me. And so I'm learning to not only be more disciplined and structured, but also um, to honor how I operate. And I think I wanted to say that before I share my, my process and my routines and what I do, because I would encourage everybody listening. And as you're trying to grow and you're trying to develop personally, because you're only going to grow a business if you grow. And that's what we're talking about here. I would encourage you to test and practice and try the things that people suggest and then make them your own because yes. it really is your journey. And there are certain things that I do that will be a bad idea for you. And there's certain things <laughs> that I do that be like, Oh, that's awesome. But you may want to customize it or change it. So um, my perfect day, which I get to have a lot of the time, probably three quarters of the time is um, I get up kind of whenever I want, um, which is what leads me to go like, I need to be more disciplined, but I get up kind of whenever I want, which is either, really early sometimes if i wake up like there was a season where i was getting up at like quarter to four in the morning for a while and i was i really enjoyed that for a season there was also a season of six months where i wasn't getting up till 10 30 in the morning um so just to tell you like i change this up a lot because that's what serves me but right now and what i'm i'll be 39 this fall and 40 next year so i'm trying to like get my act together at some point here um but i'm starting to fall into this routine of where like Ideally, I'm getting up between like 6.30 and 7.30. Um, during, the, during the school year and like a lot of the time now, I get up by 6.30 and then my son and I uh, work out. Mm -hmm. And then I will get in the hot tub for a little bit. And I, I really like meditating in the hot tub, so I'll do that. Um, but sometimes I meditate when I wake up. I just use a app called Headspace for that and meditate for like 10, 15 minutes. Um, and that's, I've been meditating for like four or five years and it was really hard in the beginning. So if anybody else is having trouble with it, it's not something you master in 24 hours. Um, kind of like a business that you move into a different realm, same lesson. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like you should stick with it because it's really, it was really uncomfortable for me in the beginning. Like I was like, I don't know why people say this is great because this sucks. Um, but uh, so I'll, I do that, meditate and then, um, I often I get to have breakfast with Rachel. So we'll, she, she cooks all my meals. She's amazing. And so she'll cook for me and then we'll, we'll be able to sit and talk for a few minutes. Then um, I'll, you know, and that's usually by that's like seven 30 or eight, or sometimes if I decided to sleep in late, it's like eight 30 ish. Um, Cause she takes my son to school. Um, and then I'll, have a shower. I'm usually listening to an audiobook in the shower most of the time. Um, and then I always, for the last year and a half now, I end with a cold shower. That's like at least, or like turn it way cold. It's at least like 30, 40 seconds. I like when I can get to like two or three minutes, but mm -hmm. um, the reason I like doing cold showers is because my day goes better. And it's because it reminds me who I am. And I know it's good. 
like, and I, I do some Wim Hof breathing before I do that. And like, I do some breath work too, um, which George has tons of resources on that for all you guys. But um, it, so I do some, I do some kind of Wim Hof breathing and then I turn the shower cold and it makes my day better because it reminds me of who I am. It reminds me that I can withstand incredible amounts of pain and pressure and discomfort and that that's part of what wakes me up and makes me alive. And a lot of what I went through as a child, a lot of what I went through in my first business, a lot of that, what I've gone through in marriages and bad relationships has brought out like my strong animal instinct in me. And it's brought out the warrior in me. Mm-hmm. And I believe that all of us have that warrior inside of us, but it's so dormant because we live in air conditioned homes and we, yep. you know, flick a button and watch whatever we want. And like, we can have our few you know, we don't have to drive anywhere if we don't want to, because we can Uber, we can have our food delivered to our house. Like we have no adversity None. and adversity is the greatest gift that the universe gives us. It is the greatest gift the universe gives us. Um, and so when I, when I do my cold shower, I really enjoy it. Um, even like before, every, every day I'm like, I don't want to turn the water cold, but then I turn the water cold and I really enjoy it because it reminds me of who I am. Mm-hmm. And, and you have to be present and paying attention. There's no, there's not a lot of other thoughts going on when there's cold water, you know, like really cold water streaming down or when you jump in the Montana Lake, it's really, really cold. Uh-huh. <laughs> and like you are, you are there. So it grounds me and it reminds me um, who I am. And so that sets my day up for success. It's also helped me because I, I basically quit caffeine. I'll do it once in every three or four months or something. Now I quit caffeine the same time I started cold showers. Um, and so it just, it wakes you up like you're awake and you're ready to go. And then after that, um, you know, get out, get dressed. And then I, I come down and use um, Alex Charfin's momentum journal. So I'll come to my office and, plan and that is game changing um it's just like it's so so perfect for entrepreneurs and then i you know then i roll into my day and you know then it's 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 you know meetings and business and and stuff like that um and then end of the day i will very often get in the hot tub um with rachel and we'll hang out and talk about the day and i i really enjoy smoking a cigar and i'll have a beer and watch tv and so like my wind down and like actually things that really fill me up and make me um, you know, feel good or getting out in nature, smoking a cigar, binging television. I love, love, love binging television. So I will do that periodically throughout the week. And then I absolutely love reading. So I read, you know, a couple things in the morning. I'll read a little bit. I listen to audio books. Um, but that's, that's a short encapsulation of my day. I love it. I love <laughs> it. What's your favorite TV show to binge or like, what's your top one? Um, one of my all time favorite shows is it's always sunny in Philadelphia okay. because the writing in that show, if you can watch, I've watched, I've watched that through probably 50, 60 times. That's probably my number one. Cause the writing, the creativity and writing of that team is just off the charts mm. and how they in such a effective and pretty balanced way, play both sides of an issue. So like everybody looks like an idiot at some point, which is the truth of life. Um, then then Seinfeld, then like Sopranos, Breaking Bad, anything with Brian Cranston, and I'll I'll watch. Like I I like I like a lot of true crime stuff and my like da- real cycle. My daughter loves stuff. It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I have the weirdest taste in shows like that you could ever imagine. Like I will watch Hustle and Flow on Netflix. I love freestyle rap. Like I'm not good at oh, it. Yeah. I don't listen, but I like the creativity process. I'm addicted to watching like underdog documentaries of like ultra runners, marathon things, right. Or random overlanding adventures through the world. Or my wife's like, you can't watch any more of those drug movies. I was like, no, I'm fascinated by the cartels intelligence with marketing and business and boom oh, yeah. and human psychology. But yeah, I have the weirdest, weirdest taste in anything. Oh, it's super eclectic for me, but anything that has psychology involved, I'm, like that is really strong writing and psychology. Yeah. I, love it. I feel like that's what like my undertone is. Cause even like the documentaries, I'm like, there's deep human psychology and like adversity in there. And um, I'm going to unpack yeah. a few things you said, cause I want to wrap them. And you said it earlier, like, and, and I wrote it and this is from our good friend, Brian, like pain is guaranteed. Suffering is optional. 
Like, and that's yeah. a huge, huge part of it. And, and you said something about how like the greatest gift that the universe gives us is adversity, which is actually why I feel like entrepreneurs struggle so hard in the beginning, because we jump from a world of comfort into a world of guaranteed adversity every day. And we get yeah. upset that we don't have the capacity to play with it. And like yeah. newsflash, I said this to one of my, my clients like a year ago and they were like, no, I'm like, if you're comfortable, you're about to crash. Like if you are comfortable in coasting in your business, the crash is inevitable. And I was like, so you have to practice that adversity. And I'm like you with the cold therapy. It's not because I like being cold. I hate being cold. I hate <laughs> yeah. it, but it, it cured my PTSD because I couldn't ever stop the nightmares, the thoughts, the flashbacks. But when you get in cold water, you can't think. And There's it's like, going on. oh, that's what my body feels like. Holy shit. Right. And you're like, cool. And so, you know, I tell people like regardless of the modality or the pattern interrupt, it could be running. It could be breath work, like could be cold yeah. therapy. It could be stillness. It could be meditation. It's just anything that gets you connected into that present moment with yourself. And I just think it was like when you said it, when you're like the greatest gift that the universe gives us is adversity. I also realized that the skill set that is least trained by most of us is adversity because of the comforts that surround us. And so yeah. it's just an interesting concept. Another book, since we're book recommending on this one, we got Profit First by Michalowicz. And you should read all of Michalowicz's books, by yes. the way. <laughs> Fix This Next, Pumpkin Plan, Clockwork, all good. Then we got uh, The Wedge, I mentioned by Scott Carney. Scott Carney's other book, which is first book, is What Doesn't Kill Us, which is The I Benefits of yes. Cold Therapy. And here's what I love about Scott. He's a journalist and he loves debunking people. So he went to Wim's house to disprove the benefits of cold theory. And then he ends up setting the world record and climbing Kilimanjaro with him without a shirt on. And I was like, I gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. I love it. There's so much. We're going to have to do another episode. We'll do one in person at the next event just for fun. But I got I to gotta rapid fire. So I got to know. So binge watching television, which, I, oh, uh, this was the other part I had to unpack for you. I didn't respond to the comments in the group yet, but um, this is what's really, really funny is hearing your answer to that question, you have more discipline than 99% of people. <laughs> and I feel I feel like people look at like me when I was in the Marine Corps and some people with structures and routines like that. When you create obsessive structure, it's a new form of distraction and addiction because it's wow. disconnection from self. What you're That's doing is you're advocating the human element Right, like in the military, we succeed because we're robotic. That is done on purpose when we haven't slept in four days and we've been training. But when you're in war, you kind of need that, right? But we're eliminating the common element. And so for me, containers are so huge. Like you literally have a container in the morning and then you have a container about how you start your work day. You have a wind up and a wind down and then you have a fill my bucket container and you navigate and mitigate in those containers. And so that's why I think it's imperative to understand that if you obsess, and this is for anybody, I get up at this time every day, or it's like, I have to go to the gym, or I have to go to the, the boom, or I have to eat this way. We're like, we'll call that orthorexia, or we'll call that an eating disorder. But yet when we do it with our schedules, we're like, I'm disciplined. I'm like, eh. <laughs> you might want to... So I, I had to say it because it came up and I was like, I'm either going to answer this in the Facebook group or I'll answer it right now while we're on here. But I think for everybody, yeah. I think what's most important is the intentionality behind the space, right? Because I will say that like, if you're like, oh, I wake up and I don't have any clue of what I'm doing today and I don't get out of bed and I don't shower, cool, tighten it up. Like self-care, right. you know, fucking do something for yourself, right? But when you're like, God, these are the three needle movers for me today. This is what's going to fill my tank. This is how I'm going to recover and maybe it's like, and meditation for you and I were the same, right? Because I had an unhealthy relationship of what it should look like. And then yeah. I started studying Thich Nhat Hanh and he had walking meditation. And I went to a few things and it's like, any moment I'm present, I'm meditating. All I'm really doing is watching my thoughts. And I was like, well, I have to do it for an hour and I have to be still and I have to turn my brain off. You can't turn your brain off. Like, no, no. that's the opposite of meditation. <laughs> and so I just, I, I had to like, 
summarize yeah. and unpack that because I heard it and I just think it's so imperative for everybody to understand. Like if you have a desired outcome and a way to fill your tank and you're being intentional with your schedule, like being a parent or getting goods rest and you follow that and you trust yourself in the process and it's intentional in a container, it's the best discipline that you'll always have because you're allowing your growth and your human element and your intuition and your gas tank to dictate where you spend your time. And so that's what I would challenge everybody on. So now I got to know, uh, mountains or beach? Mountains. Absolute favorite food. Like if you could only eat one for the rest of your life. I'm not much of a foodie. There's um, one. There's one. <laughs> that's a good question. Um, man, I don't know. An IPA, which is not food, or or bacon is my only answer. Bacon, okay. So, Mine, yeah, like, bacon. Mine, mine's chocolate chip pancakes. Like I'm pretty obsessed with chocolate chip pancakes. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm here for all of those. Um, and then probably eggs because like I'm a huge breakfast guy. I could just eat eggs all day. <laughs> when somebody when somebody asked me this question the first time, I said eggs because I'm like I can make omelets, fried eggs. I can cook with oh, them. Yeah. I can do it all. Like like eggs are eggs are a good good staple. Like I feel like you're safe yeah. with those ones. Um, what are you currently reading? I'm currently reading Beyond Order by Jordan Peterson. Uh, yeah. And uh, and then I just read Abundance, and I don't remember his name, but uh, it's an excellent book. Abundance. It's, uh, it's Abundance by, I'll tell you, Peter Diamandis. Oh, that's what I thought it was. I didn't want to say it, though, because, yeah. So those are, it's it's really, it's always interesting to me how the universe, like, gives me books or what I, what it prompts me to read because if you read abundance, like th everything is great, literally everything. And then if you read Jordan Peterson's book, which I read his first one, I just read this one. It's like the world is ending and like everything is horrible. However, there's a lot, he is probably one of the most brilliant philosophers and psychologists alive today. Yep. And there's so much you can take away from that. And so, yeah, it, um, so that's what, what, I, that's and, what I'm and to full well. circle, the open loop about you saying that you should take things on and make them your own. You take a perspective from abundance. You take a perspective from beyond order and you're like, this is my informed viewpoint of the world. And then you exactly. go from there. And I'm careful to, I'm not perfect, but I'm fairly careful to try to read things. I don't agree with and opposing views because you can so quickly silo yourself in a place that just isn't effective. If you read only what you like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I love, I love Jordan's work too. I've been, I've been on an interesting kick. I've been listening to like lectures on audiobooks. Like I've listened to Brene's the power of vulnerability lectures three times in the last month. Oh, um, nice. just, it's really interesting. I go through phases too. Like I'm like, Oh, I'll do all this. I'll do all that. Uh, but that's just yep. the season I'm in. Okay. So most important question. Well, no. Yeah. This is the most important question for everybody is like, Okay, this Gabe guy, he's this bald headed, just like George, cold therapy, gut uncomfortable, runs a team of 65, more business lessons than anybody I've ever imagined, didn't get killed by the mob, and we're glad that we got to interview him. So, like, where can everybody find you? Um, as far as my site, you can go to businessmarketingengine.com. You can see what we're up to there and uh, any help you need there. And then, easiest place to find me and follow me around is on Facebook. Just search for me, Gabe Arnold, and you will see me there. Um, we're mutual. I, I'll be, I'll be a mutual friend. You'll see he's on my stuff. He's yeah. always, we're always tagging each other. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's my main hangout. I, I'm around on LinkedIn and I'm re-engaging there, but I'm less, I'm less I'm engaged not. there right now. I think I have an account. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I have an account. I'm currently addicted to making like really crappy, but humorous reels on Instagram. That's like my current fun right now. Uh, and so I'm, I'm having fun with that one. Yeah. So now the most, the second most important question. So let's imagine that everybody listens to this episode and they forgot everything that you said, like everything that you said, but in this moment you have the opportunity to tattoo wisdom on their soul and it's going to be with them forever. You have the ability to tattoo wisdom on their soul. If they forget everything else, this is the one thing that they will take forward with them for the rest of their lives. What would be your tattoo wisdom for their soul? I'll tell you this, the same thing I tell my team all the time and that I tell my clients um, that I coach. And that is, if you show up with all your heart in this moment, in the next conversation, in the next hard thing you have to deal with, whether you have a pissed family member, team member, client, 
or there's just a problem. If you show up with all your heart and you say, my intention in, in this moment is just to serve you and help you, 99% of your problems will be solved and will go away. So just show up with all your heart and say it and things will get easier for you. Be brave and do that. I love it. And I'm giddy about how validated I am having you on the podcast because I was like, he talked about relationships and investing in people and cold therapy and breath work and said the event was awesome. So I'm like here for all the fucking things right now. I'm so happy. That's awesome, dude. I'm like, nice. my tank's full. Like, I'm good. I'm good. But no, I, I, I actually, like, from the bottom of my heart, the wisdom that you shared on this episode, um, and I'm still recording this. I just say it in front of everybody. The wisdom is impeccable. And, and I think, you know, you're a pretty humble dude, and I know this about you, and, like, I've connected to you a lot, um, and I appreciate that about you. But you are a wise, wise soul, my friend, with lots of lessons, an amazing father, an amazing partner, an amazing friend, an amazing human an amazing team lead. And so I just want to thank you for doing the work that you've done to get to this point, to be able to share this wisdom. And I know it's just the beginning because we got, we got rocket ships to build together, my friend, rocket ships to build. So thank you so much. That means a lot to me, George. I appreciate that. Of course. So you stick around and I'm going to wrap the episode. So everybody, this has been another episode of the mind of George show. That was just a little bit more validated by Gabe, who obviously learned uh, about 20 years of business lessons in 90 days. And, I have a whole newfound respect, but take it to advice. Take the advice, invest in relationships, create a culture, prioritize people over everything else. Like there are so many golden rules and golden nuggets in here from leadership to leading a team to leading yourself that are guaranteed to have a successful impact. But just like we said, only if you actually put them into practice because skills only get better if you use them. So I'll leave you with that. Have an absolutely beautiful day. Remember that relationships will always be the algorithms. I will either see you in the next episode or you will hear me in your earballs. But either way, it's time to cue the outro.